My name is Michael Schust. I was born in the country of Czechoslovakia, a very small country in the heart of Europe. In the 1920s, this was the only uh, free constitutional republic established from two states, the Czechs and the Slovakians, but it was short-lived because in 1937, Hitler came to power in Europe and eventually uh, the occupation of the Nazis uh, caused the country to be under the power of the Germans. At the Munich conference in the dark days of September 1938, the Western powers abandoned Czechoslovakia and in a final attempt to appease Hitler, agreed to her partition. With the Sudeten land in his hands, Hitler took the next step of aggression six months later, when he triumphantly entered Prague as a conqueror and announced that Czechoslovakia no longer existed, save as a German protectorate. In his path, Hitler left many grim reminders of his six-year rule. We were always under the power of someone. Uh, my father, who was born in 1920, became one of the boys that the Nazis put on forced laborers in German factories to make weapons. They call it Total Einsatz. And because my father was a man that loved freedom and was always sort of a freedom fighter, he sabotaged the work and was put in Nazi prison. Uh, at some point when he contracted tuberculosis, tossed him in the ditch and left him for dead. But he survived and uh, he kept on fighting. You may know from European history that after the Second World War, there was a struggle for power in Central Europe. And in 1948, Czechoslovakia was made a part of the Eastern Bloc, countries that were governed and oppressed by the Soviet Union. For independent democratic Czechoslovakia in the spring of 1945, the end of the European war meant a return to peace and to the freedom it had not known since 1938. But already symbols of Czechoslovakia's powerful neighbor to the east, Russia, were reminders of the Soviet's ever-increasing domination. And in the elections in May of 1946, the communists, although winning little over a third of the popular vote, became the largest single political party. And so in 1948, all the properties were nationalized, uh, private property was confiscated, all the land was made uh, federal land, and uh, people essentially lived from there on until 1989 under the Soviet oppression. Now, since I was born in 1962, I really did not remember any of that, but my parents lived through it. They were the second World War generation and uh, suffered a lot of hardship. And I remember when uh, in 1968, uh, the country was divided and a number of people really wanted to go back to sort of the more free, democratic, capitalist way and there was a movement that was led by a man named Alexander Dubček. Well, my father was one of Dubček's people. He supported Dubček. Now the government of Mr. Dubček is promising not merely government of the people, but by the people. The people have promised more of the good things of life, which have been thin on the ground for so many years. Here in Prague, there's a saying, in your own kitchen, you cook what you like. It's obvious, after all, that the Czechoslovaks don't want to quarrel with the Russians. And uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, you may know that in the Soviets uh, rolled in with their tanks because uh, this uprising was suppressed, Dubček was put in prison, and all those that supported him were dealt with harshly. So my father was put uh, in a, sort of a situation where he was kind of in in a factory on forced labors for the next 17 years. He was a very skilled and smart engineer. He was a musician, but he never did his job again until his uh, retirement. I remember when I was six years old, that was in 1968, my mother was dressing me up for school. I was in the first grade and, and she uh, was about to put this uh, winter sweater on me and suddenly pressed it to her face and cried. And I said to her, 
Mom, what's wrong? And she said, it will be war again. It will be war. Then we saw the tanks rolling in, shooting at our people. In uh, my hometown, they, they shot a nine-year-old boy because he ran into the street with a water pistol in his hand. And so, realizing their error, they took his little body and stuffed it in a trash barrel and left. I don't remember too much of the occupation events because there was an event in my own life that really shaped my life in a very, very different way. When I look back at the ways of God and preparing me, equipping me for life and for what He intended for me later on, I can see uh, why all of these things happen. One day in January of 1969, I was waiting for my mom to get home from the factory. I was at the train station and uh, on the side where they had these big wagons loaded with uh, horses, uh, I just walked over there and uh, I loved animals so I just wanted to uh, watch the horses being unpacked and maybe even touch them but I did not realize that I was standing to a, next to a big stack of these um, railroad pegs and if you know anything about Europe at that time they began making them from concrete and one of those pegs would weigh about 230 kilograms that's close to 500 pounds well they were stacked inappropriately on this pile and uh, as the children sort of put their their school bags on top of them uh, watching the horses together then as the train was coming in they would take their school bags down and the whole pile began wobbling and before you know it I hear people screaming and I see the whole pile just coming down on me and so I kind of made this last second jump and one of the pegs crushed my right leg uh, my foot and I fell on my back and then I was buried under these concrete pegs uh, thousands of pounds of concrete. I remember uh, going in and out of consciousness as these men at the train, st train station were unloading the pegs over my head and somebody put me in the car, they drove me to the hospital. I had nine fractures of my pelvis, both hip joints cracked, my right foot shattered, intense internal bleeding and my spine was severed twice, uh, my spinal cord. So. Um, I was not supposed to live. I was sort of in a comatose stage in and out. At one point I remember uh, I woke up and I was laying on this cart and there was only a sheet over me and I felt a little bit ashamed being a little naked boy under a sheet and there was this nurse that sort of bent over me and said, shh, it's going to be okay. Maybe she was an angel. But um, at that time I remember when everybody left, I kind of lifted up the sheet and I saw this thing they put on me that was bloated and, and blue and bruised. And I was like, why is this thing on me? Not realizing that was my own little stomach. Well, uh, later on, I woke up about two days later and I saw both my parents standing at the foot of my bed in tears because they told them their little boy wouldn't make it. When I look back, I'm thinking what immense hardship my parents went through with the Soviet tanks rolling in, the occupation starting, Soviet soldiers patrolling our sh streets with their machine guns, and then in the midst of all of that, reliving the horrors of the Second World War, they are told by the neighbors, quickly, quickly, go to the hospital in the city for your boy was in a fatal accident at the train station. I was in this... Uh, ICU room where there was a lot of adults that were brought in and I was in a surgery for a long time to repair my inner organs and to take the bone fragments out and so I was among the adults and for the next five months I was in the same room the hospital was always very crowded so in the room with six beds there was usually 12 or 13 of them rolled in and uh, I remember celebrating my seventh birthday that was in April and uh, the grand visit of the doctors that came in, you know, the chief surgeon in the hospital that was actually the man that put me back together, uh, uh, just uh, 
saying, so how old are you today? And I said, seven years old. And he said, that is wonderful. Oh, to be seven years old again. And I remember he turned to all these men laying on these beds around and he said, men, how is his math? And how is his reading? You realize this is his first grade, right? So I'm relying on you. And he just charged them to be, be my teachers in my first grade. Um, I was supposed to not walk again. And uh, of course, uh, being bed bound, I remember my parents, when they finally brought me home, they would took the bed and put it in the middle of our garden and they would be producing all their potatoes and, and you know, having all the fruit trees around and kids would come and visit me. And so I would just lay there. I uh, uh, was sort of isolated and obviously didn't go to uh, back to school until the second grade. But I do remember that day when my father came and he said, so do you think that you would be up to walking again? The doctors are talking about it. My father was a great man. He inspired so many people. I remember he came up uh, to me uh, in the fall of 1969 as I was laying in the bed and he said, so what do you think, son? Would you be up to learning to walk again? I said, dad, what, what do the doctors say? He says, we'll find out tomorrow, but uh, they may give it a shot. So twice a week, the ambulance would come and bring me back to the hospital for these visits. And uh, I was getting all this attention from the doctors that were observing how my bones were coming back together. And that day I did not go in, but I was in the waiting room and they called my father in and he spent a long time there talking with the doctors and then he came back and I remember all these people waiting in the waiting rooms the hospital was always crowded and my dad without any words suddenly picked me up in his arms and lifted me off the bed and carefully just put me down on my feet on the ground and then he slowly let go stepped back and he said son walk to me so I made one step and then I made the other step and a shooting pain came into my right foot and I collapsed my dad caught me put me back on the bed and he said that was two steps tomorrow we are gonna make three and then he came back as we came home and he knew that I loved to read I mean that was the only thing I could do so I read about everything I could get my hands on and he brought me a book and there was a book that was called the story of the real man that's in translation it was a story of a Russian pilot during the Second World War who was shot down by the Nazis and was shot in both legs and both legs were amputated above his knees his name was Yuri Meresiev and I read his life story about how he was given prosthetic legs and he learned how to walk again and in his final exam as he wanted to return back to the army toward the end of the war and he did they didn't want him back because he was handicapped and so he had such strong will that he practiced and even learned how to dance that russian kazachok again and i was so inspired by that story that i wanted to be like this pilot and my dad knew that i needed some inner strength so he says son you're gonna be like beresiev and you have to find the will inside of you to learn how to walk again. And I remember step by step, I was counting and, and people would hear me walking by the house counting loud, 126, 127. And my dad would always yell, that's enough, 128, tomorrow. And so I had to learn how to walk again. They couldn't give me crutches because they would pull up my weight and so m my pelvis would you know, the injuries would be separating again. So I was on two canes and just walking with two canes. And uh, so that's how we start again. It was almost like a new life. And I remember on my last regular visit, the uh, chief surgeon, Dr. Mihola was there to essentially make a closure after a year of recovery with my parents. And uh, they brought him gifts that was customary my father brought a jar of honey and they brought him some eggs and <laughs> uh, uh, as the little farmers always did and they said doctor how do we thank you for putting our son back together and, and he said he'll likely be handicapped for the rest of his life but do not thank me thank god because it is a miracle this boy is even alive i think 
that was the first time I heard the word God in my life really in a context different than oh yeah if you are a bad boy this boogeyman God is going to come and get you you have to understand that I grew up as this handicapped kid even though I learned how to walk it took me a long time to to walk normally and walk without canes and uh, then in the middle of the second grade i was allowed by the doctors to come back to the public school but only for three hours a day well not only only for three hours a day but i was not allowed to sit because of my pelvis that was still kind of growing together from all those injuries and so i would go to school and i would stand for three hours in some of the main classes and then be sent home now imagine all the unwanted attention and humiliation and laughter you get from kids uh, because at the time when teachers would be teaching and asking questions we as children growing up during this communist era we would be taught to raise our hand and stand up and give the answer and so you know how kids are standing up one over the other when they knew the answers but when nobody knew the answers like okay who knows the answer that kid oh you're always standing come on and so you sort of would be you know in the center of all of this attention and the kids laughing at you all the time and and being physically weak standing under a tree during the PE classes watching the other kids play soccer and doing athletics and and being timed and competing and so when I was in the fourth grade I got so fed up because I wanted to be like other kids like other boys I wanted to fight uh, with my fists uh, you know and, and wrestle them and all that and my mother was always so afraid so I, I began secretly practicing running and I began running uh, just out in the country and, and over the hills and everything and I became quite good and so uh, one day I entered this race in our town about 40 boys and before we started running uh, I remember the PE teacher was there and he came up to say what are you doing here you are the handicapped kid don't you understand you cannot run and so I had to go and I walked about seven miles to another little city and I entered a similar spring race there among the boys and I remember bringing a silver medal at home on my neck because I wound up being second with all these boys and I was just so excited and my mother almost had a heart attack and said you're the handicapped kid don't you understand that if you run you're gonna be on a wheelchair by the time you are 15 so that was my upbringing but uh, as I grew throughout the elementary school something happened when I was uh, almost 14 years old and there was an experimental military school that was being put together a special class of kids that they would audition from around the countries for both their physical abilities and mental abilities and mental toughness and we would be all tested and so I was picked among 12 boys into this experimental class that essentially took us one year earlier out of the elementary school which was nine years so I did the ninth year ninth grade I did in the process of six weeks in this school during the summer and then we entered into this intense training and classes and about six of us were there because we were athletes and another six boys were there because they were brilliant minds and I remember befriending this one boy that was he had cerebral palsy but he was an amazing brain and this this would be a kid that did the algorithms from like top of his head uh, but the other kids were always bullying him because he was weak and and he could not walk right he was kind of weird and so i kind of with my protective instinct just embraced these kids and we became friends and i found out that his father was a pastor and i didn't know what pastor was uh, so he explained it to me that they believe in God and and so we had all these conversations and one day in the first year of this school they brought us for an exploit exploratory visit to one of those communist run factories it was a chicken meat processing plant where there will be about 4,000 chickens going through the factory in 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 like 10 minutes and uh, I will spare you all the details but there was a room where all the chickens as they were slain and hanging on the truck would be bleeding out and 
As the truck was going through this room where all the blood would drain, there was a man or two standing there with these rubber, these rubber shoes and up to his knees in chicken blood, raking for 12 hours a day all the blood into the drain. The smell was disgusting, the place, and they would bring us there and said, who is that man who is raking the blood for 12 hours a day? Well, it was the pastor, it was the father of this young boy that became my friend in the high school whom I was protecting. And, uh, and I realized during the high school years that, that communism was evil. We had this fanatical director at the high school that was accustomed to bringing me to his office and for no reason just yelling at me and calling my father, who was one of the freedom, freedom fighters, calling him names. And, and they would groom us to become military officers. Of course, the more I learned about who uh, Vladimir Lenin was and Karl Marx and that, the more I hated them, even though they were always portrayed as heroes for all they have done in their name to my family, to my dad, my mom, my brothers. And uh, eventually uh, I just resolved in my heart that I'm not going to serve this regime. And even though I was destined to become a military officer with all the military training and all the combat training I obtained in high school and, and all that special attention, I, uh, I guess uh, when I look by God's providence, I chose music and um, almost in protest against what uh, their plan was for me i enrolled in the national conservatory and through a set of circumstances i was eventually accepted uh, in this new branch of the conservatory uh, to become a singer and a pianist i was already being trained in this national school of music for 10 years and all that so i was pretty good as a pianist but uh, as a young singer i had to learn and i fell madly in love with opera and with theater and the Italian opera especially and so throughout that time I was being trained to become a young artist even though the communists still tried to convince me to uh, to go and join the army and and join the path that they sort of had for me but uh, that never happened and I was given these opportunities as I was growing as a singer and as an artist to uh, do uh, some events eventually became regional events even national events i did some things on on television as well and uh, of course being shaped by all these events and by the life of my father who at that time became my best friend past my teenage years and all that uh, all that struggle and immaturity uh, I realized that my father was one in a billion and uh, so we had these five six years together uh, during the conservatory years where I was living his dream because he was a very accomplished musician and just loving every moment of it, singing concert and emceeing these big events. And that would be my demise because I would never be as wise as to not to open my mouth and say a few things openly against the communist regime. And so our family was already listed on what was called the black list and we would experience some oppression and some raids when people come to your house and kind of go through your stuff for no reason and so one day at the end of my conservatory studies when i was 22 years old two men rode up at our house in the trench coats uh, woke us up early in the morning and they went through our stuff and they booked me and my mother as concerned as she always was she was packing me lunch she said should i pack him lunch and and one of them uh, looked at her and said, don't worry, Mrs. Schust, he's going to be back for lunch. It's just a formality. Well, I was back for lunch, but it was almost two years later. And so through the process of incarceration, there would be another event that would shape my life deeply as I, was, uh, I spent the better part of two years in communist prison. Let me pause here, realizing that maybe most of the people living in the West do not realize what a life in a Socialist Republic of Czechoslovakia run by the communist government and by the Soviet oversight and all of that, what it was like. 
And so for me, since I did not know anything else, it was kind of normal for us to be waiting for food, you know, to buy groceries for two hours and, and essentially not being accepted to uh, certain jobs or schools because they would determine your destiny rather than you deciding what you want to be or what you want to study and being told, oh, uh, your house is not really your house. It's just a house we have entrusted you with in which you live. So you need to use it for the purpose of the collective or your children are not really your children. My parents were told that many times. Your son is not your son. It is a, a product, uh, a son of our collective. And if you do not lead him the way that we approved, we will just take your children away from you and we will raise them ourselves. And that would be happening. And so uh, we sort of navigated through that using all kinds of things a lot of people obviously were alcoholics a lot of people were using drugs a lot of people used humor that was us that was our family we had a lot of joy and a lot of humor and sarcastic humor of course double meaning humor that we used and that's how we got into trouble as well but having said all of that these raids and these oppressions and, and, and these accusations against us who disagreed were common. And we sort of got used to them because you have to realize that in the country of 10 million people, now we are talking men, women and children, so say 5 million were adults, there were 3.6 million registered informants, registered snitches. So the whole country, the whole regime would be governed by fear. Sound familiar? Report on your neighbor, right? Tell us what they are doing. If we disapprove, we're going to go and arrest them. And so anybody could have made an accusation and come and say, you know, I don't like what this guy is doing. And then the judicial system was different as well. If we were not innocent until proven guilty, we would be guilty until we would prove our innocence and so they would frequently book you and the law would allow them to put you in isolation for the next 28 days and they would usually use that to break people and to sign them up as informants and so it was not unusual that one day as they showed up and uh, as uh, they took me with them to the police station and, and they booked me and, and my best friend as well who was at the time a professional hockey player and uh, they put us in this isolation building. I had no idea why, what the case was, what happened. And of course, they put you in the isolation for 28 days and they tell you, well, we're gonna isolate you from the society and we are going to begin, because there are some accusations against you, we're gonna begin to build a case against you, but also for you so that you can prove yourself innocent. And so you'll be given a state attorney that's going to defend you eventually. And we are going to go and interview witnesses and people that have things against you and build a case. So in severe cases, this isolation time would be extended for another 28 days. And we're talking like mass murder or genocide or something like that. Because you see, in the first week or two of this isolation, most people would break and sign just about anything they would put in front of them. Well, I did not sign, <laughs> obviously, because I used all the training that they gave me for this military preparation to sort of stand up to them. And so I was in the isolation for 28 days, and then I was in for another 28 days, and then I was in for the next four, uh, seven months. And at the end of the seven months, they finally built a case against me. Uh, there were some witnesses that were coming forward. They used these fabricated stories and some true stories that they mingled into it. And they accused me and my friend of crime. Of course, what I did not know is that my friend, after two weeks of torture, uh, gave in and he signed to be an informant. And he turned against me and corroborated everything they said. So being isolated, I didn't know that. And so my case was getting worse and worse because ultimately uh, having his testimony and testimony of all these informants, the case against me they presented was on their side very, very strong. Now let me uh, describe a little bit of what the isolation was like. So I remember the first night I was put in, in the room 
with a man who was tattooed from head down, which was at that time always a sign of criminal activity. Then I was put in with a gypsy, and the third man was a junkie who was in withdrawals and was puking all around the cell. The size of the cell was on both sides that if I opened my arms, I would touch the walls. And there was a little window in the door where we would be getting twice a day some, some like, like this drink, which later on I stopped drinking because they put bromium in it, like they, they give cattle and they want to uh, calm them down and, uh, and a piece of bread. And so as uh, I waited through the first night, I couldn't sleep, I was scared, I was, um, I was 22 years old and taken from this civic life of, of artist performance and sportsmanship into this dungeon. I mean, it was a terrifying experience. And of course, the first thing was that this statue gypsy came up to me and says, when the bread comes, you will give it to me. And if you don't, I will cut your head off by night. And he goes like this and, and pulls out this, this shaving blade from under his tongue and shows me. And, and I've never seen anything like that. You know, he's hiding this thing in his mouth. And so um, so in the morning I was exhausted and I was thinking, how do I get out of this? I, I feel like this depression coming on. I feel like I want to cry. I feel I want to kill myself. And so I said to myself, I'm going to do everything I have learned. So I, I stood up by the wall and I started exercising. I did some push-ups and I did some kicks and punches against the wall and I had some spins. And, and next thing I turned around and this gypsy is sitting in the corner and I could see fear in his eyes. And he says, where did you learn all of that? And then when the window opens five minutes later, he takes his piece of bread and gives it to me. And he says, you are now the king of this cell. Every cell has a king. And he began to teach me all these prison terminology and procedures. And of course, for somebody already filled with hatred like me and, and kind of embracing the evil that was around me, being this young atheist that didn't know anything about God, about redemption, about goodness, and just being driven by the hatred against this regime, I learned very quickly where you will realize, as I later on realized, that I was brought through all of these experiencing, experiences because God had a plan for my life. What was communist prison like? Let me say that uh, it was not the kind of prison where you take college courses and uh, play basketball in a courtyard. In fact, uh, we did not lift up any weights in a courtyard either because exercise was actually against the law. And if they caught us exercising, doing push-ups on the floor, that you could be accused of planning an escape and you would be given extra year or two uh, to your sentence. I was eventually sentenced after seven months of isolation to uh, three years in prison, uh, labeled a anti-social and anti-society element. And uh, frankly, with everything I've experienced so far in the prison system, they were probably right. Uh, because the darkness got hold of me and I've learned all the bad stuff that I didn't know yet from my military training. Well, it was February, it was about minus nine. And since we mentioned that, one of the captains ordered the guards to, to strip us down and take us out into the corridor. And they let us uh, uh, jump in the snow for the next hour and brought us home with some frostbite, uh, my punishment was to be uh, in the same isolation building where at that time they were actually looking for somebody that had um, education and administrative, administrative abilities to uh, run the administration and the prison squad of about 20 men that would be doing all the maintenance and doing the payroll for the officers and also the main part was processing people uh, on a daily basis uh, six seven days a week where essentially they were bringing the accused people that lost their name and were given a number as a name and then processed out a few months later out of the isolation into the prison system. Now in my country at that time, the whole uh, main industries and the uh, black coal mines and especially the uranium mines uh, were all manned by prisoners. And uh, there was up to 750, 800,000 adults, mostly men in prison out of this country of 10 million. So you can imagine 
most of that production was done by the hard labor was done by the prisoners so i was lucky or blessed i guess at that time that i wound up actually being uh, in the administration there and uh, running the processing system and uh, i saw a lot of cruel things a lot of um, a lot of people die uh, i've seen at one time i'll give you an example there was a young mother of two children i remember processing her and seeing the picture of her children that was on the czech and polish border and she forgot to declare two packs of cigarettes and they booked her and accused her of smuggling and brought her in and two nights later she committed a suicide by cutting her wrists uh, they woke me up at two o'clock in the morning and uh, brought me to this pool of blood with the body and i was uh, asked to clean it up so they were on a weekly basis there were all kinds of things like that that were happening well the prisons were so overcrowded that usually at the anniversary of the russian revolution or at uh, the uh, birthday of of one of their you know karl marx or uh, Lenin or at some sort of an anniversary of the Second World War uh, victories, they would give an amnesty so they could clear some space in the prison and uh, and process more people. So usually the people that were punished for the first time would have their sentence reduced. So that's exactly what happened in 1985. The amnesty came at the anniversary of the Russian Revolution and all of us who were punished for the first time were given one year off of the punishment so i was there at that time for about 15 16 months and was ultimately eligible for parole because i had uh, only six months left and so by the time everything got into the court and was processed i uh, uh, was eligible to apply and so eventually i got out they tried everything possible to keep me there and keep me working because I was so sick in my mind that I have memorized a lot of numbers and a lot of names and thousands of numbers uh, to keep everything in check and to keep the inventories and uh, you could not make a mistake because mistake would automatically mean seven days in the hole which was a dark room with just one dose of bread and water per day where you would be hosed down or beaten and so I was uh, just so meticulous in how I worked in that administration not to make a mistake, of course, living in this secret fear in my heart all the time. And all this time, the, uh, the hatred in my heart was growing and growing and growing. And uh, I befriended this young man whom I mentioned already. His name was Josef Bush and uh, he was uh, a very accomplished rock climber was in the national represent representation and we began dreaming about one day maybe we'll climb in in the dolomites together and we will learn and we will enjoy the nature free again and i remember we began talking about escaping from the country and at one point he drew me a map where he climbed in the italian dolomites as to how to get from the Republic of Yugoslavia at that time to climb through certain passages and to traverse over into Italy and, uh, and, and get down on the ground in a free world. And that was the plan that I embraced. I was obsessed with it. And so eventually when I was released by the parole court and I was given 10 years of probation for the last two or three months that I had left in my punishment, um, I went outside only to find out that most people were afraid to talk to me, uh, people uh, shied away from me, I could not get a job, so eventually I picked up a job in this uh, one company that uh, was doing night shifts watching this giant computer that was processing um, payroll for the agricultural companies that were in the region. And all that time I was plotting an escape to the west and uh, to get free uh, to uh, change my name, to change my identity and one day come back to the country as somebody else and put away, meaning to kill nine or ten people, the worst perpetrators, all these police people, uh, agents, um, these, these informants, a couple of the neighbors that hurt my family and myself the most. 
So that was my plan. That's what I lived for. People often ask me, so how did you get out of the country that had this Iron Curtain around it? And it wasn't just the Iron Curtain, that tall fence with the electric wires, it was the dog tunnels, it was the, the shootout flares that you would step on when you were in close proximity to the border. It was the non-stop patrolling and uh, shooting without a warning that was going on. Well, it would be... Uh, safe to say that uh, and fair to say that I lied my way out of the country. I became very good at the art of deception and essentially embraced their ways for my own purpose. And I have falsified some papers. I have managed to delay some of my own papers. I had a passport that I obtained shortly before I went to prison. So I've never gone and traveled anywhere. And so I bought this trip to another communist country uh, of Hungary and then from there I sneaked to Yugoslavia and I went all the way through the former Yugoslavia saw some beautiful beautiful mountains and lakes and the ocean and everything and eventually I made my way uh, as a hitchhiker and on foot all the way up north to uh, a city called Zagreb and uh, even closer to the border, uh, there was a town called Maribor. My plans to go to Italy changed uh, for particular reasons that I won't elaborate on, but um, at, at that time, I came to the border uh, only with my rock climbing backpack and uh, my binoculars and a couple of knives, and, uh, and that was it. Uh, I was uh, resolved to cross the Alps uh, at night to cross to Austria and as I undertook the way my wife sometimes jokes with me and saying you know you have no sense of direction right so when I drive sometimes it catches up with me and so I laugh about it because yeah I got lost uh, even as trained as I was it was uh, that night that I was escaping from from the eastern bloc so to speak uh, and uh, I have to say also that the Yugoslavians never had the Iron Curtain and so a lot of people from the East if they managed to get to Yugoslavia they would use Yugoslavia as a crossing point into either Italy or to Austria through the through the Dolomites through the Alps and so that's what I plan to do and uh, but they had uh, a border that was heavily patrolled by all these soldiers and as I was crossing the border at one point I came to the stoppers and I saw that I crossed the border and it was about three o'clock at night it was raining heavily it was pitch black and I crossed and you know as the border sort of winds like this you cross it once and then unbeknownst to me I at some point I crossed it back into Yugoslavia and I thought I was in Austria so I went there was this structure that sort of emerged out of darkness and I heard dogs barking and I almost knocked at their door but next thing I know I was tackled by a German Shepherd and uh, suddenly I have a machine gun pressed toward my forehead and I was put in prison in Yugoslavia of course I spoke German uh, fluently pretty fluently and so I tried to lie my way out again out of it and and uh, ich bin ein Österreicher I'm from uh, I am the Austrian that I got lost and and I need to go back to my country and of course I discarded all the papers I had so they didn't know who I was but they fingerprinted me and then they put me in the dungeon with all these prisoners and I asked one of them I said what's gonna happen to me and he said well look you're probably uh, from Poland or Bulgaria, one of those smart Alex that thinks he can use our country to escape to the West. And so we're going to put you in prison to scare you. Now we got you in the system, your picture, your fingerprints. And in the morning, the commissioner is going to come. And if you cooperate, we're going to bring you inland and let you go. Because we know that if we put you back into your country or transit you back, you're probably going to get killed. And so... Uh, in the morning the commissioner came and I was brought to the interrogation room and he says how much money do you have I said not much 500 dinaros he says the penalty for violating the sovereign territory of Yugoslavia is 500 dinaros he took my money put it in his own pocket and he says get over to the transit we're gonna bring you inland back to Zagreb if you come here again we know who you are now we're gonna ship you to your country find out where you're from and you know what that means well I knew what that means you see, when I was leaving that day in May of 1986, that was the only day that I saw my father crying. 
because he was the only one of the two people that knew. I could not even tell my mom uh, because she would probably, in the goodness of her heart, go and try to prevent me from doing that. But when I said that to my father the morning of my leaving on this trip, I said, Dad, I'm not coming back. I've plotted this escape. I, I have it prepared. And, and suddenly tears came to his eyes. And he looked at me and he said, Son, do you know that this could cost you your life? And I remember saying, Dad, I'd rather die than to live in this country the way that they want us to live, without freedom. And uh, my father later on told me that he felt guilty because he knew that as him and I would secretly listen to the radio of uh, Free Europe or the Voice of America on the shortwave radio at night, he, he felt guilty that he was the man that sort of incited me uh, to the hatred toward this communist regime and, and the love for freedom that he had. But uh, it wasn't him. It was really uh, something that was planned from the beginning. And so as I was sitting in the Yugoslavian prison, and then later on release brought back inland. Uh, I uh, plotted the escape. I went to the gypsy market and sold my binoculars and my knives. And in fact, I've uh, got enough money to have discovered that there was a man that was facilitating this black trade of false transit papers through Austria. So I, I got uh, some of those fake papers as a security in case they caught me the second time so I would have a better argument. But all that to say, I will spare you all the details of uh, the escape. Eventually, I made my way across the border exactly in the same spot and uh, hitchhiked over to uh, Vienna and uh, then reported myself at the police station, uh, at the main uh, train station in Vienna. And that was quite an experience too, because there was a, a world championship in soccer going on and the policeman didn't want to deal with me. He said, come back in the morning, we are all at the station watching a match. Austria is playing soccer. And so I slept at the train station and in the morning they said, okay, uh, you can apply for asylum as a political refugee, but we have to book you. So they booked me because I violated their sovereign territory and put me uh, into uh, isolation of all things with uh, all kinds of other refugees in the camp of Treiskirchen, that famous camp where I stayed for about a week. Uh, they would use the time to activate the network of their spies and informers to find out whether your story checks out, whether you are who you say you are, whether your reasons are valid. And then, as uh, you may remember, some of you during the Cold War, this uh, immigration was uh, financed by the West. They, they wanted to help those of us that were escaping to the free land. And so because of, I suppose, my background and, and my father's status and all of that, I was given the, the level three uh, clearance and I was actually taken out of the Treiskirchen camp and was put into this little Gasthof in the Schnee Alps, about 100 uh, kilometers south, uh, south uh, west of Vienna in the town of Otterthal. And uh, it was a beautiful Alpen town, about 5,000 feet in the air. And I had, I suppose, <laughs> the nicest and longest vacation waiting for my papers to be processed in the United States. I chose United States as my country of destination, as I always admired the United States and wanted to come here to start my new life. But see, the hatred in my heart was getting even stronger and was exacerbated by all that success that I had. I felt I was smarter than all of them. I was standing uh, looking toward the border from the Austrian size, side, uh, thumbing my nose at the communists and laughing at them, enjoying my new freedom. I lived this lavish lifestyle that was filled with sin and uh, and women and, and new friends and uh, I got myself a job. I remember standing in this uh, little town 
for two days persistently waiting for this big boss who owned some warehouses there to come in his golden Mercedes and I stepped in his way and I, I, I spoke to him in German and asked him to give me a job and introduce myself as an escapee and and as they called us ein Flüchtling. Uh, and uh, he gave me a job and I worked for these people and I, I, I got money and, and uh, I was living this uh, incredibly lavish, sinful lifestyle, feeding that hatred in my heart to do what I plotted to do, to come back to my country one day under a different name and different identity and put away all the people that hurt me. Well, one day in June of 1986, I was at work and uh, in the morning as we had breakfast, uh, I was working in construction with this crew of men and one of them stuck the Kronenzeitung in my hand, their newspaper, and said, Lesen Sie, uh, read right here. And I see this story of two Czech refugees that were pronounced later on the escape of the year that made these self-made little ski lift-like contraptions with wheels and put them on the zero cable on the high tension wires between Austria and Czech Republic and did this amazing escape over the high tension wires to the freedom. Well, next thing I know, I come back from work and these two refugees also got level three clearance, so they put them in the hiding place into the same Gasthof where I was. So we became very good friends. One of them was only 17 years old, but there was this, the older one of them who was 38 years old at that time named Robert. He was this amazing guy. He spent nine years in communist prison and he was very outspoken about it. He was persecuted. And the fourth time he was getting out of prison, the KGBs were already following him. When I think of Robert, who was ultimately the man that led me to Christ, I think of the story of Jean Valjean, because it was very similar. Uh, when Robert got out of communist prison for the fourth time after serving four years, he was already pursued by the KGBs and they run him up to the mountains somewhere. And according to the story he shared, there was a young priest uh, who was uh, a real bold believer that hit him in the church and in the process of hiding him he then shared the gospel with him and he became a believer so uh, that was the one quality I noticed about this young man that that he was just uh, just filled with this joy and uh, he was just um, talking about God always and uh, talking about his story and uh, it was fascinating and yet for me as an atheist um, believing in only myself and driven by hatred, it really did not, um, it did not register in the spirit until, until that day when it did. Well, that day was the day when Robert came to me and said, I am going to Vienna and there is uh, some Czech speaking priests and believers that sell Czech Bibles. Would you like me to buy you a Bible? And uh, it kind of piqued my interest only because I knew that the Bible was the number one book on the forbidden list by the communists. So I was just curious what's in it. And so I wanted to read it. I said, of course, bring me a Bible. So he did. And I began to read it upstairs in my little Gasthof room, kind of like you read a book, you know, like page one, page two. And, and so I got through some of the writings of Moses and eventually got to the book of Leviticus and kind of it stops being interesting after all the miracles of Exodus. <laughs> so I just put it down and Robert followed up with me and said, are you still reading the Bible? I said, no, I mean, you know, it stopped being interesting. This fellow Moses, you know, with all the magic stuff he did. And he says, you need to read the New Testament. And I was like, New Testament, what's that? He was like, well, read, read the Bible, it's in there. And you need to read the story of Jesus. I was like, Jesus? Uh, isn't that the, 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 the lunatic that was on the cross that the communists always warned us about? And, and he was like, just read the book and, and read the New Testament. It was writ written for us, Gentiles. I was like, Gentiles? What? He says, just read the book. So I went upstairs that afternoon 
in uh, at the end of June of 1986 to my little room and I opened the Bible and I had to go through the content to find out that indeed there was a New Testament uh, that started with this book of Matthew and I began reading the Gospel of Matthew and I could not get away from it and I just read 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 about seven chapters of what now I know to be the Sermon on the Mount and there was something that was happening in my spirit as I was in the room by myself just with the Word of God only to realize that as I looked up at one point in the middle of this sunny afternoon the colors in that room were suddenly changed and everything became almost like this silver kind of obelisk I can't even describe it and I suddenly realized that I was not in that room alone and uh, I did not see anyone I did not hear anyone but there was such presence in that room because I felt something in my heart that I did not feel for a very very long time if ever and there was fear <laughs> fear but it was not that that kind of fear you know it was more like I just cannot explain it. It was this sense of awe and majesty of someone great just being over you and you realize what a small little miserable <laughs> person you really are compared to the greatness of this God. And so a few minutes later I just picked up the Bible and I went downstairs and I was just on fire. There was something happening in me through this Word of God that, that, that um, I was going through person to person and said, Did you read this book? I just read this book and there are things about God. Did you I believe what's in that book. And I was like the woman at the well. You know, people ask me sometimes, who is your hero in the Bible? And, and often they're surprised when I say it's a woman. It's the woman at the well that Jesus had this encounter with and revealed things. And so it was revealed to me. Jesus revealed himself to me in this encounter and, and through the Word of God. That's why, I love, that's why I love the Word of God so much. And so as I came back to Robert, he rejoiced with me and, and he said, well, now you need to become a good Catholic because that's... You know what, I'm going to be your spiritual father and you need to start your conversations with God. I was like, conversations? What do I do? He says, you pray. It's called prayer. He says, so the best place to pray is a Catholic church. So you need to go to the town and, and find a cathedral, you know, and just pray there because that is the place consecrated for this conversation with God. Now you have to realize this is the first hour of my new life. I, I believe that was the moment when I was really born again. This was the hour. I didn't know anything about what Christianity is, what relationship with God is, prayer, all of that, God himself. I had some head knowledge of what I read in the first five books of, of the Bible about Moses and, and particularly the Ten Commandments and and all that. But, but this was a new territory and, and so I took his word for it. I, I walked a couple of miles in the town of Kirchberg and I found this, there was this cathedral beautiful with that golden altar full of statues. And Robert instructed me, I asked him, well, how, how do I pray? What do I say? He says, well, there are a bunch of people on the altar. They're all gold statues. They're all the saints. And so you pick one and then two and, and you pray to all of them. And especially if you find the statue of Mary, you just got to bow down to it and you pray. And because these people are kind of like the agents, you know, that we have that will then convey the prayers to the Father in heaven. And that's how it works. And I was like, oh, okay, well, so, so as I entered the cathedral in this quiet afternoon, there was nobody there. And, you know, the churches in the Alps in Austria, they're open. And so you come there and I'm sitting there and I'm just looking at this at this altar and and there is uh, probably about 30 or 40 different statues There's some sort of a picture from Revelation and there was something very disturbing 
I even attempted to pray. I kind of bowed my head at one point and just kind of looking around and something just was not right about it. And again, you have to understand, this is like the first hour of my new life. And again, there was this sense of moral right or wrong that I have suddenly obtained in my heart that I didn't have before. And, and there was this check that what I'm about to do is not right. I didn't know why, but I could not bring myself to pray to all these statues. And, and so, and eventually as I am searching with my eyes around the altar like this, I figured it out. There on top of the altar was the statue of the devil. And it was the statue of a devil pictured the way that people sometimes understand him to look, which is not true, but kind of like this demonic looking being with the fangs and the, the goat tail and the hoofs and the bat wings, you know, and all of that. Like, and he was like over all of these guys that were on that altar spreading his wings. And I looked at it and, and later on I took my wife there, we took a video because it's still there. It's like this. and and something in my spirit just said listen do not pray to a bunch of people that are in the same group with the devil and so I said to myself I, I'm not gonna do this this is not so I stood up and I left I walked back Robert was waiting for me and saying so how did it go did you pray and I said no it was okay I and, and, but did you pray did you have a conversation with God I said I, I did not I couldn't. Well, why not? I said, well, because there is the devil in that church. And he was like, what? There is no devil. And and he just he just got very upset. And, and, and I said, no, no, listen, he's there. And he's over all of these people you told me to pray to. And, and I could not bring myself to have this conversation. So I'll have to have the first conversation some other time. And, and so he's not there. I said, no, you go and see, he's there. So Robert just runs to Kirchberg. And he comes back like a beaten dog. <laughs> and I said, so, is he there or not? He says, well, he is there, but you misunderstood the whole thing. You, you don't realize that there is like the statue of the Saint Michael with the sword standing next to him. He's about to zap him. And there's a picture from Revelation. You don't understand it. And I was like, listen, I, I don't know any of this. I just believed in God. And, and I just, I'm telling you, I, I felt in my heart, I'm not praying to a bunch of guys in the same group with the devil. I could tell you many miraculous stories about my encounters and friendship with this man Robert who led me to Christ and in some ways he was really my first convert to uh, the faith in Jesus Christ through his word because he had all these books written by popes and cardinals and I had the Bible that he gave me and I was defending the Bible as we were fighting about how to pray and what is right and what all and I was just soaking the Bible up and the word and just citing verses to him and he was quoting all these books to me and eventually uh, God really reached him in his heart and he turned to the Bible and burnt all these other books but uh, there was one more event really the pivotal event in my salvation that um, had to happen in order for me to understand that one cannot just say you believe in God but that this faith in God is supposed to be about a relationship with this divine being through his son Jesus Christ that gives us the Holy Spirit as I mentioned that there was suddenly this moral compass that was given to me at this very first hour of my faith that I didn't know I had and uh, I am still ashamed to say that even though I began to distinguish right from wrong and I knew the things that were wrong in my heart, I continued to live the same sinful, lavish lifestyle that I did before I, before I confessed that I believed in God. And uh, at one point, the, this company that I was working for was doing this international exhibit so we built some unfinished houses and floorings and everything and for three days I was in this setting where we had a prepaid phone on site and I was just showing all of our work together with all the other workers and I could get on the prepaid phone and call all my friends in Czechoslovakia and tell them what a great lifestyle I'm living in the free west and all that and, uh, and so as I did that 
uh, the boss allowed me to do it. Say, hey, it's all paid for. Just you want to call home or you want to call? My parents didn't have a phone. They had to go to my aunt's house. But I kind of got spoiled in that. And after it was over and the international exhibit closed down, I really wanted to continue my phone conversations. And so the criminal mind that I had and the arrogance that I had uh, to to uh, be smarter than all the other people, I have broken into the boss's office because you see, in the prison, no matter, matter where you are, you probably learn a lot of bad things, kind of like how to open every door. So I kind of hacked my way in and for several nights, I was pretending I'm him. I would sit at his desk in his rolling chair, I would put my feet on his desk and I would pick up his phone and I would dial these numbers of people in Czechoslovakia and you know at that time international phone calls were very expensive especially between the West and the East and so um, it did not compute uh, with me uh, the, the way that they should that I'm jacking up the bill for this for this company these people that gave me a chance to live a new life in their country that didn't owe me anything and that I was in fact deceiving them and committing crime and so, even though I knew it was wrong, I kept doing that. And one night, a few weeks later, they set up an ambush for me. And I was arrested and brought at gunpoint again to the police station. And there, in this interrogation room, just the way that you see them in, in, on TV or in, in films, with that one desk and two chairs, one for the interrogator and one for the accused and that double-sided window on the wall, it was just an empty room. And so they let me sit there, um, was brought there about three o'clock in the morning and they just let me fry there in my own shame. I felt so ashamed, kind of a new feeling to me as well. And wouldn't you know it, how the Lord set it up. As I'm sitting there, the only other thing that was in that room, we're talking again in the mountains of Austria was this little wooden cross that is right above the door and I was sitting there just just staring at the cross for I don't know how long eventually the captain came in and he sees me staring at the cross and he's asking me in German he says so what do you think God thinks about what you did tonight and I turned to him and I said captain it wasn't just tonight there was many nights as I went and I let myself in and I sat at the boss's table and and I just um, wanted to pretend that I am somebody and I called all these people and I'm sure I've caused a lot of damage and uh, and he says well you know it's unfortunate uh, you know for these crimes especially if you're a foreigner in our country here you're looking probably at about six to eight years in prison and uh, he says, so why don't you tell me what you did and when, and uh, if you make a confession, then so when I confessed everything, I said it was wrong. I, I, you don't understand, I believe in God now. And he was like, yeah, right. And, and I just knew that somehow I was set up, but in my heart, I had this strange peace. I just somehow knew that, that no matter where I am in Austrian prison, or that, that, that it's gonna be okay, because I have realized what this faith really was about and that God did not want me to live this way anymore, being in prison of my own mind and my own character. And so, as I made that full confession, the captain did something unexpected that he went out and uh, he says, sit here, I'm gonna talk to the judge. I was like, now? It's like four o'clock in the morning. So he goes to the next room, leaves the door open and I'm hearing him arguing in German with this judge that he just woke up, telling him the story of this young idiot, escapee, that committed all these crimes and jacked up the phone bill, letting himself uh, to this man's office and, uh, and trying to convince him to let me go to the United States because I've already had the permission and I just obtained the green card to the United States being accepted to to live here and uh, so it's probably not a good idea to woke up a judge early that morning but somehow this captain convinced him and he comes back and he says so 
The judge eventually agreed with me that uh, we should ship you overseas and let you do your crime in America, but there are two conditions. Number one, you will have to pay for the damages. And so we're going to find out how much the damage was tomorrow from the telephone company. And then number two, the owner of the company, the boss, he, 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 he will have to agree not to press charges against you. And uh, so he brought me back to the Gasthof. He says, look, I'm going to pick you up at 10 o'clock in the morning. You better be here because if you escape, you know what it means. We're going to track you down. We're going we're gonna to put you in prison. And I'm going to pick you up in the morning. We're going to go get the telephone bills. We're going to add it up and find out uh, what the damage is. So sure enough, we are back at the police station. He's counting all the bills and it's taking him a while i'm impatient and in the meantime before he picked me up in the morning as i'm just kind of thinking through all of this feeling this immense shame um, i opened the mail in the morning there's a letter that came from my parents and you see i have saved all of this money that i made working for these people that gave me a chance and the opportunity to make something of myself. I've saved all this money to have my parents come and visit with me and to pay for their stay and show them what a lavish lifestyle and living and, and take them around. And so I took all the money out of my box and I counted them and, and there was about 6,127 shillings. It was a lot of money, about, about three months worth of wages for certainly somebody like my father. And so I put the money in my pocket and then I opened the letter and there was a short letter that was censored, had that red stamp on it from the communists, but it was sent to me. It was probably forced. My father writing me, dear son, because of circumstances, the communist government has denied our travel to the Western country to try to convince you to come back. He had to say that. But uh, in other words, my parents were denied to travel. So I was like, what do I do with all this money? Then the captain showed up. I'm at the police station, he's counting the bills and eventually he lifts up his eyes and I said, how bad is it? And he says, it's bad. And then he writes down the number and shows it to me and I almost fell over <laughs> because there the number was 6,127 shillings and I was sitting there. And I knew that God loved me. I knew that this God somehow set me up. I could not even process all of that. But that he, he wanted more and expected more of somebody that said that he believed in him. And then he continued to reveal himself to me through these circumstances and through this setup so that I can slowly get out of the prison of my own mind, my own hatred toward the people that hurt me, uh, out of the prison of, of uh, my own past. And so then the captain shakes me and he says, okay, where did you get the money? Did you steal it? <laughs> I said, no, I made the money working for the people that trusted me. And, gave me a chance and he said well the owner's standing behind the door so let's approach him that's the second hurdle apparently you you will be able to pay for the damage so the owner comes in I could not look into his face and somehow in my broken German I'm standing in front of him with my face down at his shoes trying to uh, tell him that I I don't want to be this man that has committed these crimes and deceived these people and then God is somehow involved and that I know that it's hard to believe but but and I gave him the money and uh, and he took the money and put it in his pocket and then finally I lift up my eyes and he's I will never forget that look he was a kind man and he's he's taking this long look at me And then he stretched his right hand and he said, I forgive you.
good luck in America. <laughs> then he left. Two weeks later, I flew to Boston. And uh, I could tell you stories about how God set me up. How he provided for everything that I ever needed. I came here without any money, obviously, and airplane ticket that I paid back six months later to this International Rescue Committee, the one-way ticket for $275. Um, that was it. I didn't receive any help from the government. I uh, worked from the beginning and classic example of living the American dream of people who want to work and, and want to make it work. And I was blessed to enroll at Boston University a couple of years later and, and uh, finished my doctorate there in 1997. Um, I was blessed to uh, begin serving this great God, this great loving Father that we serve and His Son Jesus Christ to then eventually become a music director in the church and serve this God and teach people how uh, to know Him and eventually begin to preach the word and uh, go to seminary and, uh, and, uh, and, and become a preaching pastor. And uh, in 1992, my wife and I went back to the Czech Republic for the first time after it was all cleared out and the government apologized and I was welcomed back. And, uh, and God has given me a tremendous platform in uh, the former Czechoslovakia and in the surrounding countries of the Eastern Bloc to share this story that I'm sharing today with you. So I hope and pray that uh, this story of one lost, self-centered and, uh, and really uh, darkened and, uh, and deceived man that came back by the power of, of God and Jesus Christ back to life, this story will, will help you and inspire you and will help you to appreciate what you have and the freedom that you have in this country to believe in this great God like we could not in communism. And not only to love Him and to love one another as He prompts us to do, but to uh, pick up His Word and find out for yourself who He is and what He purposed for us. And then also to love this country, to love this country enough that you will be bold and brave and outspoken to never let it slip to uh, the level of oppression, tyranny, and control by this evil Marxist communist regime that uh, is always aiming to take the control of the entire world. May God uh, use this story to uh, help you to accomplish that. God bless you all.